for the word, church. So Pastor Knapp mentioned that, thank you. Pastor Knapp mentioned that, um, by the way, if you're new, I'm Pastor Happy. I prefer to be called Happy. Even when I'm angry, you can call me Happy because <laughs> that's my name. Um, so Pastor Knapp mentioned it last week. So he taught about the seven, he mentioned about the seven mountains of society, the seven mind molders. How many of you remember that? Yes, very good, very good. And the parable of the sower and the parable of the wheat and tares. And just a quick recap before we go on, because he had asked me to continue in it. And I told him, I said, you know, even if I continue on the message, you would still need to continue on my message. Because it's a lot to cover. And, and, I, and, and I just, I just want to encourage you that if you feel overwhelmed, it's okay. Um, sometimes... God bypasses our logic, but really, if you just open your spirit, he will deposit it in your spirit. And, and, and a moment will come when you just receive it in the spirit, and you might feel overwhelmed in your, in, your, in your logic. But if you receive it in the spirit, a moment will come when you read your word, and it's bam, like bulb. That's what they were saying. Okay, so it's normal. Okay, tap the, the person beside you and say, it's okay to have brain freeze. <laughs> As long as your spirit doesn't freeze. <laughs> no nosebleed for the Holy Spirit. So, we're going to do a recap. Uh, Pastor Nap mentioned about the parable of the sower, that the parable of the sower talks about the four soils, and the soil is our heart. Do you remember? How many of you remember that? Praise the Lord! <laughs> so, so if you were not here last Sunday, we t uh, he talked about how the parable of the sower is, is, is Jesus teaching about the condition of our hearts. And our hearts are, li are like the soil. There's the a, there's a rocky soil, which is our rocky heart, you know. Um, uh, there's a lot of issues that, that we deal, that we are carrying in our hearts. And we are unable to receive the word because of so many issues that, that occupy our heart. And so when we hear the word of God, it just goes through the other ear and and it doesn't bear fruit because there's so too many issues in our hearts that it doesn't have any room for the word of God. And there's the there's the the soil that is that has many thorns, many thistles and thorns, and which speaks of a heart that's preoccupied with the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of the riches. And so and so when 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 you hear the word of God, it might so it might get sown in your heart and you get excited and you say, Wow, that was really awesome. Now I understand. But then the cares of the world, the the hydro bills, the ga gas bills, and and all the bill bills <laughs> and all the bills <laughs> and all the bills and all the you know payments we have to make and the the children's whatever activities and all that all the cares of this world or the promotion adds more hours at work and the, all these things can choke the life out of the word of god so that although it was sown in our hearts it does not bear fruit because we're preoccupied with the cares of the world and and we talk about the 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 third heart that uh, the the the, blah, 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 blah. Okay, we talked about the heart that is that has been cultivated, that has been um, uh, 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 plowed, and it's ready to receive the word of God. And and when this when the when the when the word of God is preached, we receive it. And because our hearts have been have been weeded out, then it bears fruit in our lives. And so he talked about the seed that once we receive the word of God as a seed. And we begin to walk in that truth. We become the seed. Did you remember that part? Yes. Okay. Okay. Pastor Nap is the preacher. He's a rah rah rah. I'm the teacher. I don't do rah rah rah. <laughs> so I, I I'm bringing it down to a level to, that all of us can relate with. And so. When we begin to apply loving our enemies, even if we don't want to, when we begin to forgive and show and bless our enemies, when we begin to, 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 uh, uh, turn our right cheek, our left cheek, 
turn the other cheek. That's good. When we begin to turn the other cheek, when somebody backbites us and we don't, we don't backbite back, we would say we bless them. When we begin to do that, we become the seed that looks like Jesus. We become the word being fleshed out. Wow, that just looked like Jesus right there. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And so, it, first of all, we receive the seed of the word. And when we walk out that word, we become the seed that God sows in your schools, in your universities, in your workplace. You become that seed. Are you getting this? Yes. Amen. Okay. So that's where we're coming from. And, and I want to, from there, I want to start with Genesis 1, 26, 28. And I love this verse. I've always believed that this is the preamble of the purpose of man. You know, um, this is like a foreword of, of, of our purpose. And so Genesis 1, it, uh, before the verse, before verse 26, it talks about, if you've read Genesis chapter 1, it talks about how the world was created, how the created order was made. And then on the verse, on, on, on the 26th verse, God declares, God said, let us, who's he talking with here? Anyway, I could go off with that. Let us make man, you know, the, that's the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them... Rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth. And subdue it. By the way, I want to encourage everyone to bring your Bibles. Because in case of power outage, we'd still have our word. Okay. <laughs> Where was I? Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air. And over every living creature that moves on the ground. Over everything that God created. God declares the purpose of man in those three verses. Verse 26 to 28. 26 to 28. Three verses. God declares a purpose of man. God declares his intention for why he created man. It's so that we can rule over. And the rule over there is not the rule over as in, as in like, a, like a tyrant. It's a rule over as in a manager. That God created man to manage what he created. Do you get me? And he play, it's interesting because the words that he uses in the original language, in the original Hebrew, or Aramaic, Hebrew language, is that the, the, the words are actually very, it's not really, um, uh, it's a tactical term. You know, tactical term? Like military. And so he says, be fruitful, multiply, subdue the earth. The word fill the earth is to subdue. And subdue is a, is a, ter is a tactical term. It's a term of warfare. Subdue the earth. Meaning to say there's something that you need to subdue. Do you get, are you, are you following? Okay, follow me. I'm going somewhere. Promise. Okay. And so God created us to subdue the earth, not to be subdued. But to subdue. From the very beginning, when he created us, he created us to be the ones on the, as, to be the head and not the tail. He created us to be blessed and not cursed. He, his original intent from the very beginning was that we would be blessed. And out of our being blessed, we would be fruitful and overcome. Are you getting me? So many times we strive to be fruitful, but we haven't come under the blessing of God. When it's the blessing of God, when we align ourselves under the blessing of God, we, be, we, are, we become fruitful. Fruitfulness is not an act, it's being. Fruitfulness is not performance, it's being. Be fruitful. It starts here. But it's interesting because God calls man to subdue the earth and you would think that because it's a military term that he would put them in a military camp. You would think that he would create the military of Eden. You would think that he would create the boot camp of Eden. But no, he created the Garden of Eden. I, I, I probably have preached this before. I don't know if you remember, but I probably have preached this because this is my favorite message. 
It's the basis for everything that we do. Because from the very beginning, God intended for us to be overcomers from the vantage point of being in the garden. And a garden is a, is a, is a picture of intimacy. A garden is a picture of int- intimacy. In the olden times, when there was no Facebook and no uh, Twitter, oh, you're very updated. <laughs> When there was no Facebook, no Twitter, there were no malls, there was the garden. And if you, uh, if you wanted to take your, 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 wife, your spouse out on a date, you'd say, can we go stroll in the gardens? Ah, okay. Ah. In the olden times, the gardens depict intimacy. It is where people would have their most intimate conversations, in the garden. If you wanted to talk about issues in your marriage, you would say, can we go out to the garden and talk? That was how they did it back in their day. They would not say, can we go FaceTime? (laughs) They'd say, let's go do the garden, okay? And so the garden, God plants the garden, and he plants man in the garden because he had always intended for man to manage his resources from the point of intimacy with him. Follow me. Not, he did not plant a church. He planted a garden. He always wanted to walk in fellowship. He would, he, God's intention, and I'm staying, I'm belaboring this point because so many times we think from a religious point of view that our ministry is from our church. Our ministry is from our garden. This now is our garden. Our hearts are our garden now. Our hearts are the places of our intimate walk with God. And God intends for our fruitfulness to come out of our intimacy here, not from schools of ministry, not from leadership trainings. That, those are wonderful. Those are fertilizers. Yeah, those are fertilizers because sometimes you do take some dirt out of those trainings. You know, you rub elbows with people, you get dirt. Why? Because you're made of dust. Hey. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so be patient if you get offended rubbing elbows with, your, with a person beside you or with your spouse. You know why? You get dirt from them because they're dust. They're made of dust. And be- I betcha that they're also getting dirt from you because we're made of dust. I hope that's not the point you'll take home with you. That was just the bonus. So... We, God has always intended for us to be fruitful from the point of intimacy. If I could draw a chart, and I did have a slide, but I didn't bring it. (laughs) But I did have a slide, and I, in my, imagine with me my slide there, over there, okay? And it would start with Garden of Eden, and God tells them, be fruitful. So from the garden, from just both of them, be fruitful. Out of their fruitfulness, they multiply. And what did God want to multiply? He didn't just want to multiply people. He wanted to multiply his image. Because he created man in his image and likeness. And so as Adam and Eve would walk with God and they would be fruitful, they would multiply the image of God and the image of God would, would fill the earth and the image of God would subdue the earth. That is always the intention of God. That was always the intention of God. But because we've sinned, we've come far from his intention. But Jesus on the cross restored the original intention of God. So that in Christ, we are no longer the old. In Christ, we are a new creation. We're going back to from the very beginning. Where in, in Christ, we are now made perfect and reflecting Reflecting the image of God in Christ. Reflecting the image of God so that wherever we go, as we walk with God in intimacy, the cross opened the way for us to be in the garden walking with God again. The garden was shut because of sin, but the cross opened up the way for us to be with God as close as you want him to and walk with him. And as you walk with him, you carry his image and likeness. As you walk with him, you begin to be fruitful. As you walk with him, you begin to multiply his image. Forgiveness begets forgiveness. Mercy begets mercy. Kindness begets kindness. You multiply 
as you are walking in fruitfulness and you're only walking in fruitfulness, John 15, John chapter 15, Jesus said, abide in me and I'll abide in you and you will bear fruit, fruit that remains. You, we could come to church every Sunday, but if we're not walking with God, we're just coming to church. There's no change in our lives. And so, I, I, you know, um, I, anyway, I don't want to go off because that's just my introduction. Okay, so I got 20 minutes. Let's give Izzy a hand. Yay! <laughs> okay, bookmark that thought. This is better. Bookmark that thought that we were, God created us. So as we tend the garden, that's why Proverbs 4.23, if, if you could show that, please. I'll say, thank you. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. So now, in, in the new covenant, our gardens are our hearts. And that's why the Bible says, guard your heart. In the same way that when God planted Adam and Eve in the garden, he said, tend it and keep it. Keep meaning guard. Guard it. Guard your heart. Because it's your heart. Out of your heart will flow the wellspring, the issues of life, it's from your heart. That's why God tells us to guard our hearts very closely. Because as we tend this, as we guard it, we bear fruit. And as we bear fruit, we multiply. Not just us, but the, 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 our surroundings begin to experience the blessing of God. They begin to partake of your fruitfulness. You're partaking of the fruitfulness that God has brought into Pastor Knapp's life. Last night, he's not here, so I can talk about it. <laughs> it's our secret. <laughs> Don't tell those who are not here. <laughs> I.e. Pastor Knapp. Delete from the recording. So last night, he got a message from his, from his aunt in Manila that GMA had... Did you know this? GMA had reached out to his aunt in Manila... And asked if they could interview her at the talk show about Pastor Knapp's life. And because they saw the, the 700 Club video clip on GMA7, and on, which is a huge t TV network in the Philippines, about how the Lord had uh, changed his life. And so I was, uh, I was telling Pastor Knapp, I said, why don't you um, tell because he has not told his aunt that we're coming home. So why don't you tell her that we're coming home, and that way you get to be interviewed live on the, TV, on the talk show. Whoa. I married a celebrity. Okay. <laughs> don't tell him that I told you. Okay, but, but the reason why they're asking for his story is because of a, the huge drug com campaign, anti-drug campaign now in the Philippines. And they wanted to highlight that there are drug users that the Lord is able to change. And so, and so they've now, so what is happening is that people are partaking of the fruit that God has placed in Pastor Knapp's life. His fruitfulness has multiplied the blessing he has received, no longer has stayed with him, but has multiplied around the nation. Sorry. 
Jesus' name. <laughs> Are you getting this, church? In the same way, when God encounter, when you encounter God, when God encounters you, you receive that seed, and the change that takes place after that encounter is the fruit that is out of that seed, and that fruit does not just stay with you. It is the nature of the fruit that comes from an encounter of God. The nature is that it cannot remain in you. It has to spread abroad. Wherever you go, that fruit shows up. And when that fruit shows up, many of us are here because we experience partaking the fruit of someone's healing. Partaking the fruit of someone's marriage being reconciled. Partaking the fruit of someone's deliverance from, from drugs, from alcohol. Yeah, we're here because we, partake, we partook of that fruit. Are you getting me? Again, that's just my intro. I, I need to go forward. Okay, moving forward. Seven mountains. So that is our, that is our starting point. If this was snake and ladders, how many of you know that game? Okay, if this was snake and ladders, we're just in the start. Okay, now we're moving forward. And I wanted to bring up all the seven mountains, but we don't have time. So what I'm going to focus, I want to bring to remembrance all the seven mind molders of society. Let's read it. Home or family, church or religion, education, government, media, arts and entertainment, business. These are the sectors of society that shape a culture. You read through history. History has been shaped by those mountains. History is shaped, has been shaped through those mountains. But today, I want to highlight two mountains, okay? And please follow me. I know it might seem like a maze, but just be amazed. <laughs> Okay, it's hot. <laughs> I want to I want to I want to highlight number one: home. Never underestimate the value of your home in society. Never underestimate the value of your marriage in society. You might say it's just us. No, your relationship, your family, your home. How many of you have heard of that statement? The family is the basic unit of society. Yeah? And so never underestimate. So many times we undervalue the, the, the impact of our homes in society. But I want to show you today that in history, I just wanted to bring up one, uh, uh, a few uh, critical points in history wherein the home has defined our culture now. And we're going to start with the Greco-Roman culture. Greco-Roman culture is both the Greek and the Roman culture. In the Greco-Roman culture, children and infants were only considered assets or possessions. So if their existence proved to be difficult, they were easily considered as liabilities. And so infants born with disabilities were smashed on rocks, left to die by the river. How many of you have seen the movie 300? All the young people shout amen. <laughs> so the movie 300 um, is, is, a, is a picture of, of these gladi uh, not, not gladiators, Greek Spartans, the Spartans fighting against Persia. Persia, right? Yeah. And, and there was a part of that movie where if they saw, that was partly, that was historically correct. That if they saw the moment the baby is born, if they saw that the muscular structure or the bone structure is, is, is very weak or tiny, they'd throw them. So the Christians, after the resurrection of Jesus and when the book of Acts took place and people were begin to believe, give their lives to Jesus, what they would do is they would row down the river. They would row on their boats down the river and rescue babies that were thrown out into the river or smashed by the rocks. And that's what started the orphanages. Because Jesus taught that children are important in the kingdom of God. They were driven by Jesus' teaching when Jesus said, let the children come to me. Do not, do not. Hinder them from coming to me. And when he taught that, just that one line immediately built a 
principle among the people, among the believers that, hey, children are valuable to Jesus. So we can't just throw them out. Where, but in their day and in their time, normal culture was that children were nothing. They were only assets. They had to be strong so that they had laborers for their fields. They had, to be, they had to look smart and strong so that somebody can receive an inheritance and continue their, continue their legacy. But in the kingdom, children, even with disabilities, have value. And so Christians would rescue those children out of that teaching. And in Psalm 127, verse 3 to 5, we, we are told that sons or children are a blessing or a heritage from the Lord. Children are reward from him like arrows in the hands of a warrior or sons born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their enemies in the gate. Children had value in the kingdom of God children have value and in and so when the Christians began to rescue children they began to indirectly preach to their culture that hey children are valuable and do you know that those who rescued these children were not the rich ones who could afford to house these children they were the mere slaves of their day and they would rescue the children and adopt them as their own with their little means. Why? Because they were driven by Christ's teaching. Home is very important. When they began to see their home that way, when they began to see the value of their sons and their daughters, and they began to impart to them what God wanted to impart to these children, God is no respecter of age. God's no respecter of age. That's why the moment Sam and Anna, I remember when Sam was still, when I was pregnant with both Sam and Anna, not at the same time, but, but every time I got pregnant, I was, my, my, my uterus was very sensitive. I would always spot. And so, and so what I would do, they, the doctor told me, you can't get active. You can't, you, you got to behave, basically. And you know me. I'm very, it's hard for me to behave, especially in praise and worship when it gets intense. I'm like, ah, and, and the doctor told me, you can't, you can't do that because that's going to do threaten abortion. And I would say, when I would feel the presence of God, I would say, Lord, this is your son or your daughter. This is your child. And Lord, I really want to get engaged. I, would, I, I, would, I really want to engage in the presence of God. I would say, baby. You're going to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit wants me to dance, I will dance. Because we're going to cooperate. With I would speak to my baby that way. I, I, say, I would say, you're, I don't know if you remember that, RJ. But I would say, if the doctor may have said not to dance, but I can see a dance move right now. And I need to do it. I need to do it. So baby, you're going to cooperate. And every time I would do that, like I would dance. I would still dance. And nothing happened. Nothing no spotting took place. But babies, even from the very womb, God tells Jeremiah, even before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. That's how valuable these children are. Even before they're conceived, God knows them already. That's how valuable you are. That's how valuable we are. Okay? So, home is very important. It is the, it is the starting point of all the mountains. Home is where we begin to tell each other what is your value, what is your worth. It is in the home. It is in the home that our wives feel valued. It is in the home that our children know, understand their identity, understand their worth. Another thing in, in, that God, that Jesus' teachings did with a home in their time was that the apostles' letter to the Ephesian church about the Is the apostles' letter to the Ephesian church about the dynamics of husbands and wives upheld? It, they, it upheld the value of women at home. In their time, women, pretty much like the children, were possessions, properties. Ephesians 4.25, the Bible teaches husbands. Really? That's 4.25? That's wrong. Sorry, Aldi. Ephesians... <laughs> Let me go to my Bible. Ephesians chapter. Let 
Oh, you're right. Sorry, it's Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23. That's far. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23. No, verse 25. Ephesians 5, verse 25. Husbands, husbands, love your wives. Love. Say love, husband. Say love. <laughs> love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. In 1 Corinthians 7, verse 3, the husband should fulfill... Uh, I don't like that version. Sorry. <laughs> so in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 3, it actually says, the husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. Meaning to say, in, in my version, <laughs> bear with me. 1 Corinthians 7, New King James Version says... Let the husband render to his wife the affection. See, that's why I like this version better. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise, likewise also the wife to her husband. The, the, the Christianity began to teach marriages that, hey, this is not all about the men. Value the women. The, the value of women was upheld through Jesus' teaching, by the way Jesus treated the woman in adultery, by the, caught in adultery, by the way Jesus treated the Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus upheld the value of women. And so at home, the, because the Christians began to do that, that became, in the long run, a culture. It even, in fact, affected the laws of their day. We're in Christians began to speak for the value of women. Christians began to speak for the value of children. The laws that we enjoy today, protecting the rights of women and the rights of children, are all rooted, if you trace history, are all rooted from Christian homes practicing that truth. Boom. Do you get me? It all started in the home, and as the home multiplied, as many homes began to walk out the truth in the word of God, they began to affect the laws of their land and the laws began to shape culture. Are you getting this? So many times we neglect our home in pursuit of income and it's not, it's not because we don't care, it's because we do care, but sometimes, sometimes we care too much for providing, but losing the time we have with our children. And I, I want to share with you, I know that this is, not a, this, is, this is a very sensitive subject because a lot of us, we, don't have, we, we feel like we don't have a choice. We got to do it so that we could provide for our kids. But we always, you know, I want to share a testimony. You know, just, just earlier this month, we had a conversation with our kids. We sat down in our breakfast table and we had a conversation with our kids. And, and, and as the year is coming to an end, I know it's that fast. It's way past July, or I mean June. We talked about our plans and our goals. And, and, and I, I, we asked them, do you want... Do you want daddy to get uh, another job, like, you know, a part-time job uh, in, in addition to working in the ministry and mommy to get a full-time job and so that we would have more money and we could, we could get our own house or we could get a second car and all of that? Do you, uh, what do you guys feel about that? How do you guys feel about that? And our children, our children's response really touched our hearts because they said, uh, we want your time with us. That's exactly what they said. If you work, mommy, if you work more hours, you're not going to have time with us. You're going to be so tired when you come home. Because I'm already tired working with <laughs> I guess. And, then, and so you're saying, like, and if daddy gets it, then, then we won't have time with daddy. And we won't have time with mommy. And, at their, at the, and they said, we're happy with where we're at. 
we, we, we're good with this apartment. We're good with this, you know, with our school. We're good with having one car. You just make arrangements, mommy and daddy, when you use the car. They were telling us what to do. And, and, so, and, and that is a blessing to hear that from your kids. That they're not into, I want more, 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 more. Because at this point, we're unable to. And, and, and we told them, you know, I could. I could get a more, more hours at work. But they said, we want your time. If you get more hours, you're gonna, we're going to lose. And, and, and we see that, that there is something to be noted on from that conversation that children, children, for children growing up, if you have little children, the, the most important thing to them is our time. It's our time. And, and it spoke to us very loud and clear that our time with our kids. And I'm going to explain further. Wow, it's already 5 o'clock. I'm still at home. Okay, and, and, and so we look at in the 19... I, I want to take you back to history just very quickly. How valuable, how, how significant the home is in shaping the culture. In the 1950s, this is post-World War II. How many of you remember post-World uh, World War II ended in 1945? Right? 1945. So World War II ended. And all the soldiers came home from war. And so they, a lot of them had PTSDs, post-traumatic this stress disorder. And, and so here they are, 1950s, coming from 1940s, of course. And at that time, the rules at home were very rigid, wherein children were treated as children can only be seen but not be heard. They were taught not to speak up only to listen. And the, the, that, is, that was the culture of homes and during that time. And the fathers came back from war and they all had to deal with their trauma. And so they, a lot of the fathers were absentee fathers. And plus the rules that restricted the children's freedom. That was a time when rock and roll started with Elvis Presley and all of that stuff. And they were not allowed to listen to rock and roll and rebellion started. And, and make the long story short, the 1950s absentee fathers made a way for the 1960s hippie movement. Because children just wanted to be heard. And they began to write poems, and they began to write books, they began to write a, 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 a story and songs, and they began, to, they began to have their own groupings called the Greenwich Village. How many of you heard of the Greenwich Village? Okay, so those were the times when they would live together because they did not have community at home. So they sought for a sense of community with their, with their peers. So they would establish villages and live together free. Whatever your mind thinks, speak it out. Why? Because they did not have that at home. They started to create it their own, created their own thing. That led to the sexual revolution, the, the, the LSDs, the, the Woodstock Festival. How many of you, raise your hands if you've heard of the Woodstock Festival. Uh, don't be shy of your age. <laughs> the Woodstock Festival, the, the dreadful, the dreadful dead, the dreadful dead. That was a time of, of Rock and roll music, expressing yourself. Why? Because they did not have that freedom at home. They were not heard. So they made a way to be heard and they did it out of rebellion. They, had, they, were, no, they were not fathered. Nobody mentored them because their fathers had to deal with their issues and not to point or blame the fathers, but that was the setting. That is the power of home. If our kids don't experience a sense of community at home, they will seek it outside. And so our homes are very important. Our homes are very significant in our culture. The 1960s feminist movement, the leader was Betty Friedan. And, and, and it was a response to the oppression of women at home where women were not allowed to buy clothes, whatever they want, buy no, that was not the cause of feminist movement. But there was a lot of oppression where men just ruled over women, dominated over women, did not let them speak up, did not let them um, uh, join and participate in making decisions at home. And out of that oppression came the feminist movement. There was a lot of other factors, but that was a main factor of the feminist movement. And although the feminist movement brought a huge contribution to our, to our society, wherein women can now vote, that's one of the biggest uh, uh, impact of feminist movement. A lot of the women, however, took that movement to the other extreme, where it became a movement of attacking men and marriages. 
where they began to see marriage as a concentration camp rather than a relationship designed by God. Home. Our marriages are very important. How we deal with our spouse, how we deal with our children shape how they will think of homes. Because they too will one day become a spouse and they too will become parents one day. And so we bear fruit here, it will multiply. Whatever fruit we bear here, it will multiply. Harriet Beecher Stowe. How many of you have heard of Harriet Beecher Stowe? Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uncle Tom's Cabin is a book in the, in the 1800s that sparked the, the, the Civil War, the U.S. Civil War, wherein Abraham Lincoln came to, to uh, you know, Abe. Abe came to uh, uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe. Harriet Beecher Stowe is shorter than me. Ha <laughs> ha. Thank God for short women. And Harriet Beecher Stowe was a short woman. And he wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. It was a novel about the oppression of, of Afro, Afro-American slaves. African-American slaves. And that book started a whole, the whole civil war. And so Abe came to Harriet Beecher Stowe and said, Oh, you're Harriet Beecher Stowe, the, the short woman who started the whole civil war. His, her book started a whole civil war that emancipated slavery. One book. But you know how she wrote that book? What brought her to that point of writing that book? It was because of the dinner times she had with her father and mom. Wherein at dinner time, her father was a pastor. And her father spoke about justice. Her father spoke about the value of African Americans. Her father spoke against slavery at dinner time. And from there, her passion was built up. Her passion got developed and said, I must do something with what I have to promote justice and she wrote a book home started at the dinner table started at the dinner table parents we i some of us you don't i don't want you to feel guilty i don't want you to feel like it's too late my my children are all grown up now i wish i did that i wish i knew that i don't want you to feel to be filled with regret but you can teach this still with your young with your children when they become parents themselves you could still teach them, uh, teenagers, you could still teach them, I made a mistake, I should have done this. When you become a parent, please do this to your, parent, to your children. But if you have little children, begin to take your dinner table as your strategic boot camp. I was so inspired when I read that story of Harry, or I guess I'm just going to end with home. <laughs> I was so inspired with when I read the story of Harriet Beecher Stowe that all she started with was that dinner table. It was a dinner table. She pointed out the dinner. How did you write that story? How did you come up with that story? It was a dinner table discussions with my dad and mom about justice. And my dad is a wide, he's a, he's a very, he, he loves books. I forgot the term. Wide reader? Bookworm. My dad is a bookworm, and, and he, he did that with us. In our dinner tables, he, we would talk about, at the age of grade school, we were still in grade school, he would say, if you drive by, if you are on the jeepney, and you see someone in that jeepney, jeepney is our public transportation, kind of like the public, public bus here, but only it's more fresh. <laughs> no need for AC. <laughs> and, 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 and we were we were taught as little kids where he would say, if you ride in the public transportation and you see someone throwing trash inside the jeepney, you better pick it up. You pick it up, even if it's not your trash. Why? Because that jeepney, the moment you stepped in, just became yours. When you walk by the sidewalk down downtown Cologne, <laughs> down, down in the downtown streets where it's so dirty, and she, he would, he, our dad would say, if you see someone throw their garbage right there and then, pick it up. Don't matter. It doesn't matter if it wasn't your trash. Pick it up because that sidewalk just became yours the moment you stepped on it. And what he taught us was you own this city. If you own this city, you take responsibility for it. He would be, we would be driving down the street and if he, and, and this really literally happened. We'd be driving down the street and someone in the jeepney in front of us threw a Jollibee trash, like a huge trash out of the jeepney in onto the road. He got off because it was stoplight. He got off the car, 
went to the jeepney, talked to the person that threw, and said, can you get off the jeep and pick up your trash? And we saw that with ourselves. We saw that from ourselves. And we saw how he modeled that. And that is the value of him. That is why I'm passionate about my city. That is why I'm passionate about my nation. Because we, we my dad cultivate that, cultivated that culture. And church, imagine if our homes are cultivated with that same culture. Where in some, someone backbites someone, you come home and you say, you know what, my friend talked against me, talked behind me, and then you say, well, you know what, you forgive, and you just, you know, if you're offended, if you can't forgive, confront, and you teach that to your children, and they begin to multiply, that's kingdom culture, wherein if you know that your daughter is offended with you, if I offend my daughter, and I know when I offend my daughter, God will tell you, and then I would, I can't sleep until I go to her room, and I said, you know, I'm so sorry, I know what I said was wrong, and I would sit down and ask forgiveness, and we would, we would just, I would just reconcile. If we created that culture, the reason why I started doing that, we started doing that with our kids, is because that's how valuable our homes are. The culture you create at home will define the culture that your grandchildren will live in. I'm going to say that again. The culture you develop at home right now will define the culture that your grandchildren will live in. What I'm doing right now with my kids is because I'm seeing my grandchildren from afar. Children are, val- are valuable. God designed and oh, I so when that's my struggle. That's always my struggle. I want to say more, but there's no time. Can I say a bit more? Just a bit more. And so here at home, if 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 we whatever we do at home defines <clears throat> the culture, collectively speaking, then we are to be careful with what we do at home. What we tolerate at home, our children will tolerate outside our homes. Again, what we tolerate at home, our children will tolerate outside their homes. If we... And so here, <laughs> I got distracted right there. Just very quickly with education at home. Education at home. God designed, we don't have time to go through all the scriptures but if you can read your whole bible that would be great (laughs) but god designed education to start at home if you just go home right now and read the book of deuteronomy you'd be amazed of the laws that god established in among the israelite camp and he said to the israelites you teach this to your children at home what are those laws that they were supposed to teach their children it did not specify the age it just said you need to teach these laws to your children and these laws are civic laws sanitation laws health Civic relationships, justice, finance, tithing, banking, lending, borrowing. Read the book of Deuteronomy, agriculture, work ethics, history. He keeps saying, tell your children what God did. Tell your children what God did in your time. History. That is our conversation at home. Foreign policy. How do you treat the cities around you, the countries around you? How do you treat the refugees that come and seek for refuge? How do you, those are being stated in Deuteronomy. And so let's not limit our children or our young people to, well, they're teenagers, that's all they're in. Or, well, they're, they're just kids, They'll not, they won't understand. They will. They will. Now, you don't have to talk like academic terms, you know, like, you know, like very highfalutin words i don't even know how to spell highfalutin but you know it does don't but education starts at home our homes god intended for our homes to be our first schools and so the mountain of the home is very important and and for many of us we probably we probably feel that we didn't do a that much of a good job. And, and I'm not saying that we're perfect. I'm not saying that Pastor Knapp and I do it perfectly because it, it is far from perfect. 
But because we have this knowledge that, wow, this is how we treat, we're supposed to treat our children. So now our chi- we treat our children. When they, when they come home complaining, Mommy, a lot of my classmates don't believe in God. Then we'd say, we understand that. We know that. And what, how, you, how you address it is that you start a prayer meeting in your school. They started a prayer meeting in school. In nutrition break, at one point, there was nine kids who joined them for their prayer meeting. Why? Because we told them, no matter how you tell people that Jesus is real, the spirit in the air, the prince of this air, has taken captive of the minds of children to believe opposite. And you got to battle it in the spirit first. We disciple your kids. And they don't pray like, oh, Father. They just say, Father, we open this school to you. We just, Very simple prayer because we ask them, what do you pray? They just say, Lord, we open this school. We invite you to invade this school. And they pray it like as if it really matters. And to this day, well, it's summertime. <laughs> but to the end of the school year, they still did it. Not, not many kids were consistent in their attendance, but both of them still continue to do it. I said, does not matter if not many kids join? Two is minimum. And there's two of you. We disciple our kids. Why? Because Jesus taught us, do not hinder the kids from walking in the kingdom power and kingdom truth. Our homes. It is not too late, parents. It is not too late to start having a meeting and asking forgiveness from one another. It is not too late to have reconciliation at home. It is not too late to ask forgiveness. It is not too late to release forgiveness. It is not too late for healing to take place in your home. Because with God, He is not limited to time. He is not limited to our failures. He can do what He promised He would do. So, next time I preach, I'll talk about Harvard University. <laughs> but what I wanted to, uh, please, we, we were tackling just the mountain of home. And already, that's big. That's big. Broken homes. Broken homes. And I'm not saying that there's no hope for broken homes. Because even broken homes can find healing at the cross. And that is why the cross is central. The cross is important. The cross is essential. Because you could teach this, but without giving the hope of the cross, people will only feel regret. And that's where I want to end. I want to close this message by saying, the cross still stands. And the arms of Christ are still open. And as long as that cross stands, as long as Christ's arms are open, he can make all things new but the way to make all things new is by forgiveness the way we weed out our garden is forgiveness in the same way that God weeded out our hearts from all those sins by forgiving us when we forgive our family members when we forgive our children when we forgive our spouses We're making a way for God's kingdom to now be built in our homes. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I just thank you that your word is eternal. It's not limited to our past. It's not limited to our shortcomings. It's not limited to time. Lord, for some of us, we've We failed as parents. Lord, we just humble ourselves today. And we come to the cross where there is forgiveness, where there is hope, where there is acceptance, where there is love, where there is mercy, and where there is redemption. That you are able to still redeem what we failed to do. You are able to pick it up when we give it to you. You're able to pick it up and you're able to start anew. And Lord, I just lift up to you our homes. Lord, we lift up to you our homes. Come on, church, just lift up your families. Lift up your children. Lift up your marriages right now. Father, we lift these relations. We lift our families to you. That, Lord, especially those that are going through attacks of the enemy, Lord God. Lord, we just lift our families to you. And we say, let the victory of the cross overcome every attack, overcome every offense in the name of Jesus.
Let the mercy of the cross overcome our bitterness. Let the abounding grace of Christ overcome our unforgiveness. Lord, I just pray right now for the cross, for the power of the cross to be made manifest in every home in this place. In the name of Jesus, I pray right now, Father God, for every marriage that is being attacked by the enemy. Lord, I just pray for, for your power, to, of, for your power to just overtake in Jesus' name. I pray for children who are wayward, Lord God, who are, who have turned their backs on you. God, I just pray for your grace to overtake them in the name of Jesus. Lord, There's, it's never too late, Lord. It's never too late, Father God. And we're laying down our homes at the, feet of the, at the foot of the cross in the name of Jesus. Lord, I just pray, God, that each one of us, you would shift our paradigms in the way we see our children, in the way we see our marriages. That it, w it does affect. It has a huge impact. Our family has a huge impact in our society. So, Lord, I bless every home. I bless every marriage right now in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen.